The story of Arif Nakvi and the Abraj Group is the story of a very successful private equity company, the largest investor in emerging markets in the world, that was built in a non-traditional way, led by a Pakistani, based in Dubai, and destroyed by the Americans, American private equity companies, and people who were dissatisfied within the company with the way in which he was taking it towards its future. Nakvi was taken down because he had built the most successful private equity company investing in emerging markets. And American private equity companies wanted to take control of those investments that he's made in those markets which are some of the fastest growing markets in the world. But he had also made a very important strategic investment in 2008 in Karachi Electric. Karachi Electric is the engine of Karachi, the city, which is the engine of the Pakistani economy. Whoever controls Karachi Electric has a lot of influence on the politics of Karachi, the city, and therefore the politics of Pakistan. Now, Chinese have been developing a string of pearls, a range of ports that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative, the alternative global trade network, which is designed to challenge and destroy US economic dominance. Karachi is a key element in that Belt and Road Initiative. After running Karachi Electric from 2008 to 2016, turning the company around, reducing outages, improving efficiency, making it profitable, it was time for the Abraj Group, a private equity company, to exit. They wanted to sell Karachi Electric to Shanghai Electric, a Chinese company. The deal was done in October 2016. In November 2016, Donald Trump was elected President of the United States. Big donors to Donald Trump's presidential campaign were US private equity companies. They decided, the American administration, that Karachi Electric should not be sold to the Chinese. But Eric Nakvi was not only selling Karachi Electric to the Chinese, he was also encouraging Chinese investors into his new global fund, APEF6. A billion dollars worth of Chinese money was going to go into that fund and therefore into emerging markets. He was even considering selling a chunk of a barrage to the Chinese. That put him on a direct collision course with US interests. And the US decided a barrage needed to be stopped. Interests that were loyal to the United States within Pakistan blocked the Karachi Electric sale to Shanghai Electric. And then an operation was launched to destroy the company. This was an economic hitman operation. The research on Arif Nakvi has revealed that he was an arrogant, loquacious uh, businessman, entrepreneur, a great deal maker. Um, I don't think I would have wanted to work for him. Um, I, lots of people were annoyed with him over many years and many deals because he won many deals. It's revealed that his company, Abraj, was a good private equity company, not spectacular. It didn't win every deal. All its funds were not always successful, but over a 15 year period, it had a good, solid track record. What is interesting about it is where it invested. And it invested in the fastest growing economies in the world, the emerging markets, places like Nigeria and Kenya. And it built a global network in those places. Now, for a, another private equity company to build such a network would have cost them $500 million. So if the US private equity companies wanted to become a barrage, they would have had to invest that amount of money. Unless, of course, they could pick up the barrage funds on the cheap. And my research has found that this is a story of geopolitics and race. It's geopolitics because of Karachi Electric's importance in the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's about race and identity because Arif Nakvi was passing as a private equity guy on Wall Street and in the city of London. He was actually a Pakistani nationalist. He was passing as a great globalizer at Davos 
and the World Economic Forum. But actually, he was a Pakistani nationalist. And he was passing as an Arab in Dubai, where his company was based. But actually, he was a Pakistani nationalist. And he worked brilliantly for all of those people, so long as he was making them money. But in the end, he was a technician. While he made money for Dubai, he was fine. And he was helped by the Dubai authorities. But when he stopped making money for them, because of the economic hitman operation against him and the indictment against him, then he could have been the tea boy as far as they were concerned. He was completely dispensable. There was always another technician who could make money for them. And in the city of London, as Margaret Thatcher said, he was not one of us. He was, again, a Pakistani. And he reverted to that identity as soon as he all was the vulnerable. evidence that I've seen in all the documents that I've read, all the emails that I've seen, all the interviews, I have not found the evidence to substantiate the allegation that Arif Nakvi stole $385 million from Abraj, its investors, its creditors. That allegation occurs in one document. It's a liquidation document that was filed in the Cayman Island courts. And a lot has been made of it in the Wall Street Journal and other places. If he stole that money, where is it? The facts are, when the company went into liquidation, it had assets that were greater than its liabilities. In other words, it could have paid all its debts off if it had been allowed to restructure in the way that NACV planned. Secondly, all investors in all Abraj funds either had their money returned to them or that money is still invested in portfolio companies. One day those companies will be sold and the investors will get their money back. If this money had been stolen, then these are very strange thieves. The people they're meant to have stolen from got their money back, made a profit on their money, or had interest paid on it. They're very strange conspirators. All their meetings are fully minuted. And all the remuneration that Arif Nakvi got was approved by the board, passed by the auditors on multiple occasions. And in fact, and this has surprised me a great deal, Nakvi took less than most founders of private equity companies. One of the allegations that emerged in the indictment from the Department of Justice is that a bribe was paid in order to facilitate the purchase of Karachi Electric. The bribe was uh, meant to have been paid to a fixer and then to have been passed on to the Prime Minister. Now, what we know is that um, Arik Nakvi made raised donations for Imran Khan's election campaign in 2013 from friends in Dubai. We know that he supported Imran Khan. We know that he made donations to Imran Khan's hospitals. We also know that his other charities in Pakistan paid out around $150 million to create, for example, the ambulance service in Karachi. Uh, what we don't know, and what, we have, uh, what I've not found anywhere, is any evidence that any bribe was paid. And what makes me think that it probably wasn't paid was that if the Department of Justice in the US had proof that Arif Nakvi paid a bribe, they would be prosecuting him under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And at this point in time, they are not doing so, which suggests to me at least that they don't have the Arif evidence. Nakvi is a victim of time, place and identity. He's a victim of time because of the Donald Trump administration coming into power at the moment at which he'd sold or was trying to sell Karachi Electric to the Chinese. So in that sense, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He's a victim in terms of his identity. He believed in globalization. He was a regular at Davos, at the World Economic Forum. He drank deeply of the Kool-Aid of globalization. He believed you didn't need a nation state. His company was based in Dubai, registered in the Cayman Islands, operating in New York and London with its investments around the emerging markets. But all of that was a myth. 
the whole idea of you not having a nation state to protect you was revealed to be a myth as soon as something went wrong with his company. So he was easy victim to those big interests that went after him at that point. And why did they want to go after him? Because he had built a network in emerging markets that would, it would have cost UK and US private equity companies a fortune, estimated at half a billion dollars, if they were going to build the same network of investments in those geographies. All of the Abraj funds were taken over either by UK, US private equity companies at bargain prices after the liquidation process of the Abraj well, I was writing a completely different book when I got into this. I was writing a book about stasis being the condition in which the world was in during lockdown. And I came across the story of Eric Mackley, who was at that point fighting indictment from the UK to the US. And I just began to look at the story from the perspective of someone who was under house arrest in South Kensington in London. So I read the indictment from the Department of Justice and there was something about it that did not hold true. And I began to kind of, there was a thread sticking out and I began to pull on it. I also attended one day of the hearing at the Magistrates Court of Westminster and met a journalist from the Wall Street Journal and walked back from Marlborough Magistrates Court to a bus stop with him. What struck me about this guy was that his whole being was consumed with the idea that Arif Nagvi was guilty. So one piece of it is that it's an easy story. It's a Pakistani with a huge company, $14 billion under his uh, management. It fits into every kind of stereotype. The second is that these journalists were systematically fed material from hacks, or leaks, I don't know. I don't know whether an outside agency hacked the email server of the Abraj group, or whether somebody who hated Arif Nakvi within the company, and Nakvi was an arrogant guy, right? You don't get to be the head of a global company like that without having a massive ego and upsetting a lot of people. So someone within Abraj may well have leaked that material. So it could well have been a hack an external agency hacking the email server. Either way, that material was then systematically fed to journalists on the Wall Street Journal and other outlets. And the Wall Street Journal ran and ran and ran with this story over the whole period of the takedown operation. Indeed, if you look at the chronology, each time it looked as though Nakvi might have found a way out, new material appeared in the press, new leaks took place. Someone orchestrated this. I'm not suggesting that the individual journalists knew they were part of this kind of an operation. The Braj group was taken down in a series of precision strikes. An anonymous email was circulated to investors telling them to question the way in which funds were managed. They began to ask questions. But that an email was then leaked to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Articles appeared. Those articles questioned the reputation of the company. So Nagvi returned all the money to all the investors with interest. The company therefore survived the first strike. The second strike was a leak or a hack of material which showed that those investors had asked for an additional audit. Now, there had already been audits by two of the world's leading accountancy companies, KPMG and Deloitte's. And there had been legal opinions by Freshfields, all of which said Abraj did not use funds incorrectly. No funds were missing, but they did raise some questions about the way in which the firm was managed. Those questions were addressed by the Dubai regulator, who imposed a $300 million fine on Abraj. And in many ways, the matter should have rested there. The company would have contested that. But instead, the material was leaked to the Department of Justice or the Department of Justice leaked the material and an investigation by them began. When that was leaked, when that material was leaked in February 2018,
that caused what was effectively a run on My that. research indicates that it was a combination of internal discontent within the Abraj group, external pressure from US private equity companies, and interests in the US government that were responsible for taking down Abraj, aided by the US lobby within Pakistan who blocked the sale of Karachi Electric to Shanghai. Abraj was founded in Dubai in 2002, and it was extremely successful and adventurous in the way that it managed its investments in emerging markets. One of the problems with investing in emerging markets is companies there don't have the same kind of record keeping, so you can't make the same kind of investment judgments that you would do if you were investing in a Western company. So Abraj developed its own methodology of how to value those companies and worked with those companies at what's called deal level to make them better and more efficient. Karachi Electric deal was concluded in October 2016. Now, in, 20, in 2008, when Abraj bought Karachi Electric, the US Embassy was delighted. WikiLeaks uh, cables show that they were very much in favour of Abraj because of its Western values running Karachi Electric. So the flip side of that is when in 2016 Abraj decided to sell Karachi Electric to the Chinese, they were dismayed. One of NACV's problems was also there was the change of government and Trump came into power. In the election campaign, NACV had made speeches in Washington attacking Trump and saying it would be a disaster if he won the election. His nemesis, therefore, was now President of the United States. Along with Trump coming into power, American private equity came into power and key figures in the private equity industry were appointed by Trump to key positions in the administration. Those US private equity companies wanted what Abraj had. So he now had, instead of friends in the White House, he had an enemy in the White House. And alongside that enemy were his direct competitors in the private equity One industry. of the key weaknesses that was exposed by the destruction of Arik Nakvi's Abraj group was his identity. He was not a white, Anglo-Saxon Protestant businessman. So when things went wrong, Nakvi suddenly discovered that he was in the end a Pakistani in a white world in London and New York. And he was a Pakistani in an Arab world in Dubai where the firm was based. So in London and New York, while he was going to Davos and while he was talking at the World Economic Forum, and while Bill Gates was inviting him to come on to the Giving Pledge, that was fine. He was their, their token South Asian. He looked good in the photo shots. A row of white men, Arif Nakvi. It, it framed well in the media, and he was welcomed in part for that reason, and in part for his success, and for his passionate advocacy of impact investment. So while things were going well, his identity didn't really matter. But when it all went wrong, then suddenly he was only passing as a private equity guy in London and New York. He was actually a Pakistani private equity guy. If you read the media coverage, what you'll find at, at some point in almost every article, it says Pakistani born. Would it say London, you know, UK born? Would it say white? private equity executive? I don't think it would. His identity therefore matters when he's placed in a position of weakness. That's in London and New York. He was not one of us. He didn't fit. He wasn't the same kind of clubbable character that dominates the city and Wall Street. In Dubai, slightly different. In Dubai, he was a technician. He was a technician who made money for the family offices of Dubai and the wider Gulf. While he made those, those family offices money, then he was their great friend. He funded um, Dubai art for a decade. He was there with the ruling family in photo shots. While he was making the money, while he was making Dubai look good on the world stage. But when that went, suddenly he was like the T-boy. When he made one of his very early deals, to buy the Inchcape Middle East company. 
an Arab who owned one of those companies was told that from tomorrow, Arif Nakvi will own 49% of your company. And this guy said, a Pakistani can't be my partner. A Pakistani brings me my tea. As soon as the technician stopped making money for his Arab partners, he was as good as the guy who brought the tea. He was cut off at the legs and he'd never been back to Dubai from that moment he left it um, after the initial destruction of the company was put in. Multiple similar cases. And what happens in those cases is that companies are fined and, and individuals are charged with civil cases and they pay fines or their companies pay fines. What's happened in this case is that criminal charges have been levied against Arif Nakvi and certain other key US executives. and UK private equity companies took over the funds that Abraj was running. And because the liquidation process was a disaster, they picked up those funds very, very cheaply. So they did very well out of it. The second group that benefited are lawyers and accountants. Karachi Electric is crucial to the politics of Karachi. Karachi is crucial to the politics of Pakistan. And it's the economic engine of Pakistan. 60% of the tax revenue of the country comes from Karachi. If you control the energy of Karachi, you have a strong influence on the city. That's number one. Two, Karachi is an incredibly important port itself, and it provides energy to the Chinese port 10 hours away up the, up the I coast. I was given interviews uh, by Arif Nakvi because I sent him some work that I'd done, and he felt I was open-minded. I didn't have a preconceived idea about this case. I interviewed him over eight hours, four separate occasions. My view of him is he's not a crook. I would not have ever wanted to work for Arik Nagvi. But you don't build a $14 billion company, a global network, by being a nice guy, necessarily. You build it by being a consummate deal maker, and you build it by getting people to follow you and believe in you. Along the way, you're going to leave casualties because you're going to get the best of them in deals. And he left casualties and he made enemies. I never met him in his prime. The guy I met is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. The guy I met is traumatized. His life has been destroyed. He's been in jail. Now, there are lots of victims in the world and he doesn't come number one of the people we should necessarily care about. But he is suffering an injustice. He should not be extradited to the United States. He should go to court. He should face a justice system. He should have a hearing and try and prove his innocence. I don't believe he's a crook. I think he made mistakes. Um, and I think he got things seriously wrong at times. And he deserves his day in court, as anyone else does. But that court should not be in my view, in the United States. It should be in the UK. He stands no chance of getting a fair trial in the United Raj. States. In the end, wasn't saved because it didn't have a nation state to act, as the Russians say, as its roof. Because Arif Nakvi was a Pakistani in a white man's world of private equity. And because there were too many forces arrayed against him in political terms, in geopolitical terms, and in financial. Nagvi is facing extradition from the UK because of US judicial overreach. It's, I think, a politically motivated prosecution. And the US to UK extradition treaty is completely flawed. It was created as a counter-terrorism device. It works only one way. Basically, British citizens and foreign nationals like Nagvi in the UK are extradited to the United States. But US nationals are very, very rarely extradited from the US to the UK. He's being extradited to fulfill the political agenda of the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission, not because of any crimes that he has really committed. He will not get a fair trial in the US if he's extradited because there's too much politics connected with the indictment against him. And because everyone else who is indicted at the same time has cut deals in order to plea bargain um, and give evidence. 
So everything is weighted against him. He's the only person who still claims he is innocent. He's the only person who's still fighting these charges. In those circumstances, someone has to be the fall guy. Someone has to be the scapegoat. And in my opinion, that will be Arif Nakvi. And he doesn't stand a chance of getting a fair trial in if the US. Arif Nakvi is extradited, his defence psychiatrist and his prosecution psychiatrist have both said there is a very strong chance that he will impulsively commit suicide. He is going to be sent to, potentially, to the same jail in which Jeffrey Epstein was sent. He will be held there for years while the documentary disclosure process takes place. He's already traumatised. He's already suffering, in my view, from post-traumatic stress disorder. If he is indicted, I don't believe he'll make it to the US. I believe that he, his depression, his trauma, his post-traumatic stress disorder will overcome him. If he is indicted, then he will not receive a fair trial. So he would go to prison, I think, for the maximum amount that they can possibly send him to prison. I don't know why the government of Pakistan is not getting more involved in supporting and protecting Arif Nakvi. I think they're waiting to see what the outcome of the extradition hearings might be. Um, I think there were certain problems um, initially when he was arrested. Um, a report was circulated that he had called Imran Khan um, directly after his arrest. In fact, his defence lawyer says he had called Imran Khan the evening before he left Islamabad and the only call he made after his arrest was to his son. So I think they're trying to avoid getting involved until they see which way it falls. Um, what we do know is that when the Wall Street Journal alleged that he had paid, he, Arif Nakvi, had paid a bribe, one of the only times we've seen unity in Pakistani politics is when government and opposition parties both categorically denied that any bribe had been paid in that instance. What we don't know is why the Pakistani government isn't stepping up to defend one of its citizens more rigorously.